Hello, I'm Justin Cates, Director of Emergency Management for the City of Nashua, New Hampshire, and also a board member at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, NAPSI. I want to welcome you to another component of our uh, session on virtualizing emergency operations centers here at the INSPIRE conference. Uh, today with me is the Walmart Emergency Management and Business Continuity Team. I have Andrea Davis, who is the Senior Director of Global Emergency Management and Business Continuity. Lucas McDonald, who is the Director of Emergency Operations. Faith Newton, who's the Senior Manager for Emergency Preparedness. And Brandon Ivey, who's the Director of Enterprise Business Continuity. Um, between all of them, they really led the efforts of Walmart to virtualize for this pretty, mag pretty massive response, especially for an organization like Walmart. Uh, so this is an interesting session because uh, like some of the other uh, fireside chats that we've done, you've heard about what government has done to virtualize EOCs, but now it'll be really interesting to hear about it from a corporate perspective. So Andrea, you'll start off with a presentation and then we'll go into a, a chat after this. Great. Hi everyone from beautiful Bentonville, Arkansas. Hopefully someday we get to meet you in person. And thank you, Justin, so much for this opportunity to have us today. And so I thought to kind of tell the story of how we got to today, to give you a little bit of a background um, of what emergency management looks like um, for us at Walmart. And you'll notice a lot of similarities, I'm sure, to your day jobs. Um, and just kind of wanted to highlight that for you. And as Justin said, you know, we're the team that kind of coordinates and facilitates the response for the entire company. There's a, a few missing players here today, um, mainly on our disaster recovery side and then our crisis technology. And I'll be going over um, their sections so you can kind of get the big picture. So I'll kick us off. So give you an idea of scope and, and I'll take a step back um, for just a minute. So I, um, I'm the new kid on the block for the emergency management team. I joined on January 6th of 2020. I was coming from the Walt Disney Company. Similar job there, I headed up global crisis management. Um, mm -hmm. And before that, I was with FEMA down in New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina recovery work. And um, the date's significant, and I'll tell you a little bit as, as we get into our story of how we kind of changed our operations to go virtual. But I'm not sure like if I had known what the world had in store for me on January 6th of 2020, um, if I would have made the same life choices. I'm very happy now, but there were definitely moments, um, and I'm sure all of you can relate to last year, feeling very overwhelmed and not knowing if I could do it. Because I, I knew Walmart was the world's largest retailer. Like I knew that, but I didn't really know what that meant. And of course, when you're going through a global pandemic, um, you learn really quickly, like what that means um, from an impact to not only from a business standpoint, but then also how you can help um, in times of crisis. And so our, our mission is, I'm sure very similar to a lot of yours, you know, is to make sure that, you know, Walmart is pretty much prepared for anything that comes our way. We want to make sure, and, and Faith is going to kind of go over our strategy on how we make sure all of our associates know what to do um, when it's a really bad day. And then, of course, when it is that everybody has the tools to respond to and then recover from all hazards. And so idea scope, and again, um, world's largest retailer, we all kind of know what that means, but then there's a sense of like on paper, what does that really mean as far as impact? Um, every week, we have 220 million customers. We have 2.2 million associates, so employees around the globe. And one of the fascinating things that we, I learned um, what, during my tenure here was that Walmart is pretty much everywhere in 24 different countries under different banners. And in the e-commerce um, that I had no idea, the companies like Bonobos fall under the Walmart umbrella. And our fleet, one of the largest in the world, 6,500 tractors and 55,000 um, trailers. It's pretty amazing from the scope. As far as strategic programs, and I'm so happy to have Lucas, Faith, and Brandon with me today to kind of give you a little more in-depth view into each of them. On the, the planning side, um, both on crisis and business continuity, and looking sure that we're consistent across the globe. So no matter where you are, or if you're part of the e-commerce 
side of the house that we are all speaking the same language and our plans are done with the same approach and then tying everybody back uh, to us here at corporate headquarters. And so if we have a global response like we ended up with last year, that we're all doing this together and have the same approach uh, to it. And to make it more seamless, right? Speaking with the same voice. Faith is gonna go into details more about how we prepare and then also our engagement um, with the public and private sector partnerships that we put in place. This was key, um, especially as COVID was getting started and each state was making different decisions on regulations and then how we could interact with each of them and especially as we rolled into hurricane season last year and how could we do it safely if we were going to have a, a response like Hurricane Laura, where we would physically send folks to help out with the recovery effort. Emergency operations, Lucas is going to tell you that story because obviously COVID was one thing that we had last year in the uh, massive unprecedented unprecedentedness that we saw last year. And he's going to kind of go over um, some of our notable ones. And I learned new terms last year, a derecho, what in the world was that? And so we went through it. And so he's gonna share a little bit about that. Uh, disaster recovery and the crisis technology, I'll kind of share um, some of how we do our work and the technology that supports it. Um, I'll jump in on that section. As far as setting the stage of how we respond as a company, and if you remember, this is our umbrella um, of for everyone, um, e from e-commerce um, down to our our local, um, you know, country and in any of the markets. We want to make sure we all fall under this umbrella, so we all respond the same way. So we have our local teams um, that would reach back up to either regional or a division. And then coming back into our EOC, which Lucas will go over, and we have emergency support functions, very similar to many of you um, in local jurisdictions. We we followed how FEMA has set up their structure, just nuanced with terms. And then we have specialized response plans um, focused on public health, and obviously in the kind of the cyberspace as well, and civil unrest. Both of uh, uh, well, actually, it felt like almost all of our specialized plans got a lot of work last year. <laughs> Our poor emergency support functions were part of all of them. All going up to kind of two more advisory bodies here at Walmart. We have a corporate crisis management team. So think heads of functions. So HR, technology, kind of your senior officer level and helping us out with kind of the strategy across the board for the whole company. And then funneling up to our executive council. So that's our CEO and his direct reports. All right, so with that, I am gonna turn it over to Brandon. Thank, thank you, Andrea. Um, so I'm Brandon Ivey, I lead our company's uh, crisis planning and business continuity program. Um, I've been with the company now 16 years. Um, a large, large percentage of that was spent during doing security risk management. I've got some background with Federal Protective Service doing coup planning. And for the last six years, I've spent that um, designing business continuity strategies for our company's most critical business functions. Um, I think what I would say, you know, Andrea kind of covered off on kind of our approach to crisis planning. And as you'll notice, a lot of that is very hierarchy based. And um, while it may appear pretty simple, um, that accounts for just over about 700 plans and about 42 uh, crisis management teams around the world. So there's a lot of work that kind of goes into kind of developing and building out that, stru that structure and then supporting it through maintenance throughout the rest of the year. Um, as a program, as you can imagine, as large as Walmart's, um, one of the, the premises that we do everything and the way that we kind of approach um, our program is around being globally consistent, locally relevant, integrated in everyday behaviors, and then business driven. And so, you know, certainly with the globally, globally consistent from a business continuity planning standpoint, I've got a team of experts here in Bentonville, Arkansas, where we understand and we know the, the, that our, our company's program has been uh, mapped back to international standards around the world. We know the different types of markets and the banks and other things that we operate. And so we've developed certain, certain standards and guidelines, which we deploy and we maintain um, throughout the throughout the country and around the world. Um, 
On the planning team, our team works directly with a number of coordinators who are embedded in the business. And they, act, they actually are the ones who execute the tech, technical aspects of the program along with the plan developers, the plan, plan owners, and then those executive sponsors that we're kind of relying on to, to make it relevant and drive it within their business. Our approach to, to developing business continuity plans is, is really to focus on the most critical business functions first. Um, as you can imagine, once again, a company this size, um, we simply can't create a plan for everyone. And so we, we worked to simplify the program the best that we could. And then we focus on those, those, um, those business areas with the lowest RTOs um, first. Um, not that the other ones aren't important. We do create a strategy for them, which we will call our quick action plans. And that really supports their um, initial response and recovery, the ability to account for their associates and to know where and when to go in the event of a, a, a business disruption impacting them. Um, as, we, as we approach the plans, um, we, we have an all hazards approach and the, the focus here really is around, um, you know, developing strategies for a loss of associate, loss of facilities, loss of technology and loss of a key third, key third party. And so um, aside from those specialized crisis plans that, that Andrea mentioned just a moment ago, these are the areas that we really try to drive home for those because we believe through our experience that if we can respond and recover from one of those events, it will pretty much cover most of other disruptions that our, our company or our teams might encounter. Um, one thing I'll, I'll just kind of point out here as well is, um, is at, the, at the planning level, at the very funda fundamental, we develop these strategies for the business team so they may respond and recover without, um, without being prompted from me or Faith or Andrew or Lucas. They simply um, have a plan in place, they activate that plan, they move into action. Um, those plans then report into a crisis management team who, based on the level of incident, they may activate their plan, uh, provide the necessary resources to those, those plans, and then report into Lucas's emergency operations center, where he'll provide more of a global or more holistic approach to kind of the company's response to that. Um, so, here on the next slide, um, I'll cover just a little bit about the way that we approached, um, you know, 2020 uh, with COVID and the series of other natural disasters that we, we might have faced. Um, well, around the world, we had business continuity plans for most critical business functions. We had a public health threat plan in place, uh, but most importantly, we had that enterprise crisis management structure that kind of brought them all together and integrated them into the company's holistic response. Um, back in mid-January, mid kind of about as a planning team, we were very much in the observation fostering phase. And as our partners in Asia um, had begun to experience the public health threat crisis and begin implementing their plans based on the structure, um, they were really implementing based on that localized event. Um, by the end of February, we had detected that in 57 locations internationally, um, you know, COVID had been identified as a public health crisis of international concern by the WHO. And so we really transitioned into more of an enterprise approach where we started to then integrate all of those other um, areas of the company into the, the Global Emergency Operations Center. Um, at the time, there were a few areas of our business which were um, still hadn't been onboarded to the program, but we worked very quickly to do more of a, a mini BIA or risk assessment to work with those individuals to kind of set up their strategies and get them integrated into the response. Um, this was kind of a particularly exciting time. So, you know, me being in the, in the crisis planning business for, you know, five years at the time, it was the first time to actually see our crisis response structure actually working and then around the world to see all of those plans, all those crisis management teams activating and then coming together for one global response. So pretty exciting thing, hopefully never again in my lifetime, but um, <laughs> certainly, you know, if you're in the planning business like we are, 
um, it, it's pretty neat to see all that work and effort starting to pay off and to see that it actually works well. Um, a couple of things that, you know, we started looking at as we were responding there um, was really around, um, you know, as our international market started going into lockdown and going into remote, um, we had experienced an ice storm many years ago and it really tested our VPN, um, created some challenges for us. So we were really a little bit concerned about um, what that was going to look like when you, sit, when you send our entire corporate environment home. Um, but essentially, really focused on that loss of technology, loss of uh, uh, facility scenario. We work very fast to prioritize and leverage the, the data and the key points from the business continuity plans to identify and prioritize associates, even down to the user ID level for prioritization for VPN access, which um, fortunately we didn't, we didn't require that, but certainly we were prepared to do that. Um, just knowing that we could um, complete some of our most critical functions like closing the books and ensuring payroll and things of that nature um, at a time that was a little bit, um, um, you know, kind of um, new, new to us, I guess, so to speak. Um, but in a very short time, we had dusted off all those plans, worked with the leadership and essentially got them all integrated into the response and then um, by the time March had come around, our planners had really kind of dug into the details of those plans and um, in ways, and they actually tested and further developed those in ways that um, I'd say even through our best, best support and work, um, we hadn't been able to think about. So as a result, we really got some more robust strategies um, and it really required them to kind of dig in and um, really um, put some effort into the plans that in some cases, they may have just kind of been a little bit superficial with. Um, well, you know, kind of wrapping up, what, what seemed to work well for us, I'd, I'd say, you know, for the most part, having a global structure, um, which integrated all those markets and planning entities into the company's response. Um, having a public health threat plan in place and understanding who those first responders were from around the company and how they would lead our organization through the event. Um, and then having strategies in place for the loss of facility, loss of associates, loss of technology, and loss of key third party, which in many cases our plans, our plan owners had implemented not only for COVID, but for, for the several of the other business disruptions that we might have encountered through the year. So um, I guess going forward, we, you know, what we really learned was the importance of the key data and um, planning for those key third parties and understanding their capabilities, um, as well as you know making sure that we had the right people engaged for uh, critical support um, and decision making throughout the, the response. So that kind of sums up a little bit of the year for me, uh, particularly around COVID, but also as it relates to some of the other areas we might have activated some of those plans, Andrew. No, thanks, Brandon, and I totally agree with you. Of being kind of a planner at heart, you know, you rarely get the opportunities to see every plan you've ever written activated at the exact same moment and work in conjunction. It's it's both a nightmare and horror story uh, in into a good news story. And once I felt once I could kind of like put my big girl pants on about it all. It was something awesome to kind of watch and see and how everybody um, worked together. So it was really cool to see. So thank you, Brandon. Now I get to turn it over to Faith, who had, I would imagine a very similar experience working um, tirelessly as a team of one uh, focused on associate preparedness and our engagement um, with the public and private sector. Rarely do you kind of see the fruits of your labor and then she got to see a lot of it come through. So Faith, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Andrea. Hi, everybody. Faith Newton here. Um, I lead the preparedness part of our business. Um, and I've been with Walmart for seven years. And all of that has been on the emergency management team in a mix of preparedness and actually on the planning team. So it's also exciting to see um, that come to fruition and to know the, the work that Brandon's team put in this past year um, was incredible. So on the preparedness side of the business, um, like probably most people in January of 2020, you started a new year and 
had all of the things planned out that you were going to do and what your strategy was for the new year. And then by the time we got, you know, mid-February, it went out the window real fast. Um, so that was the same from preparedness for us. And so uh, you'll notice it's preparedness and public-private partnership, and we'll get into the public-private partnership here in just a little bit. But that was a big piece of the shift was how do we go and focus on something that's truly going to be a national event um, and really a global event? And so what does that shift look like? But from a preparedness standpoint, a um, couple of our key things that we do on a regular basis from a strategy standpoint is have different types of training resources available for our associates, whether you are in the store, you are management over a store club, you work at a corporate office, supply chain, it's making sure you have the resources and the training opportunities to know what to do should you come into a situation, as well as do different campaigns around personal preparedness and getting ready for hurricane season or national preparedness month or great shakeout. So those are key foundational pieces to our preparedness program. Um, but when everyone is not at the office, how do you then complete an awareness campaign as you um, still want information out to your associates, your employees, but it looks very different. Um, you're also in the middle of a response. And so how do you balance preparing for something while you're responding to crisis fatigue? And so a couple of things um, from a, a virtualization, if you will, of preparedness this past year was actually some of the things you see on the slide here. So National Preparedness Month is a, is a key component of our um, business, and we try to put visuals out um, to connect with our associates. But when no one's walking around the office to see those visuals, we went back to um, what we call a lock screen. And so when you put your computer to sleep, we can actually put a message on your computer. And so the picture you see of the Walmart truck is from Hurricane Laura and was our lock screen for a couple of weeks for all of our associates. So just a reminder of one, we're going through a crazy hurricane season, but two, take some time to prepare. Um, and then we had a theme around it to spark preparedness. And so driving that engagement with our associates, but also putting it right in your face every single day as you go to log on to your computer was a way that we kind of shifted um, within that virtual component, as well as trying to make it fun. So you're in a new environment. Um, I will say Andrea did a great job with our team personally to keep our team engaged and keep it fun on team meetings. So we took that energy and we put it into preparedness and created a preparedness bingo board. Um, challenged people on our internal work sites to see if they could get a bingo or a blackout on their board, um, send it to their team meetings and see if they can create a competition within it. Um, we did a photo contest for Great Shakeout and have some great photos of people drop, cover and hold on um, with their dog or Lucas who needs to clean his desk, um, you know, whatever that looks like. So creating some fun environments to awareness around campaigns. And then the last picture is um, the Brady Bunch Zoom Square, if you will, that I think all of us know way too well. Um, but that was how did we turn preparedness and a conversation into a podcast that we can communicate with our associates and communicate with people on our team and take our personal experience and give it to one another. So just a few ways that we took preparedness um, completely shifted into a virtual space, but we still stuck to our core strategy. We just executed them differently because we had to shift drastically on the public-private partnership piece of it. So um, we also focus on high-risk training and crisis response toolkits, which come across in our internal um, internets and flip charts and procedures, um, getting ready for hurricane season. But all of that kind of took a back burner, if you will, um, at the beginning of the year to truly kind of developing and expanding our public-private partnership. Um, we've had them around for a long time, but how do you then go and actually communicate with all 50 states plus tribes and territories and um, other countries as you're looking at information flow and a massive response? I vividly remember asking Andrea if she ever remembered um, how many you know, Stafford Act declarations do we have and how many states at one time, like what was the max number? We couldn't really think of one. Um, Andrea, I think we can answer that question now of it's 2020 and it's COVID. And so we really took this approach of taking that virtual component, um, getting connected to our teams, using other components of our business that do an element of this on a day-to-day -day basis. So working with our government relations team, working with our compliance team and you know regulatory visits and pulling all that together to really kind of 
build our bench strength to have this engagement in public private partnership that then transition into you know hurricane season and one thing that we've always done is if we need to we will actually deploy somebody from our team out to a state well how do you do that when you're looking at um, a COVID environment and our states even there in the eoc and so it took it a lot more of coordination from a technology component can we do this virtual to you know really what's the threshold where we need to go and we need to be able to be in the room with them um, make sure our associates are safe but also make sure that we can get that information flow and so we were able to to deploy to texas and louisiana um backtrack a little bit i actually deployed for covid um, up to fema until the hotel decided to close and then i had to get on a plane because i had nowhere to stay um <laughs> because there was a potential national lockdown so you know it always takes a little bit of um, fun and interaction but at the end of the day we see the value in those partnerships and we know that there's such great coordination um, with our partners and so um to kind of pull that all together i'll tell you the story of the black hawk helicopter that's on here and that is from north carolina and i believe it was hurricane florence and there was a um, assisted living facility that was basically on their own island they could not get in and out with the floodwaters and conditions were not um, well and so they needed some air conditioning units and so we were able with our sam's club partners to get those air conditioning units to where a Blackhawk could drop in and pick those up and then fly those in and drop them off. So those are the types of things that we love to be able to tell the story and to help facilitate through those public private partnerships because we're sharing information. Um, we, at the end of the day, have the same goal of to help everyone respond. And so that's a little bit of what became our year um, was really focused on those public private partnerships. So. An interesting fact with that, just to kind of leave you, um, 2019, we processed, if you will, um, I think it was about 20 um, emergency declarations that came through across different storms because we look at them for different um, impacts to the business and how does it change how we respond. And in 2020, we had nearly 3,000 come through a different state, um, county, city, national level. Um, that we were processing through on those pieces. So definitely a shift in how we operated, but not necessarily a shift in the strategy behind what we did. So it's a little insight into preparedness and public private partnership. Andrea, back to you. Thank you so much, Faith. And as Faith mentioned, you know, as we kind of dug deeper into 2020 and we're seeing the impact and it seemed like every day it was changing, the importance and the reliance on technology was significant. And, you know, I'm walked into a brand new environment and, and Walmart obviously operated very differently than, than I did at Disney. And the team was very familiar with this tool called Zoom. Um, and I thought it was a Disney character, to be honest. And so I had no idea um, what this was and was kind of irritated that I'm like, come on, let's just have a meeting. Why are we doing this? Boy, um, you know, my whole life is on Zooms and it's just crazy how fast it feels. Even though if you look at a day-to-day -day basis, it seems like you were frozen in time, um, but how fast we all pivoted um, to how we operate. And our backbone of, of how we, especially from an emergency operation standpoint, is, is all based in technology because of with the global footprint that Walmart has, obviously, we don't have physical teams. Um, uh, anybody who's part of the global emergency management team is based in Bentonville, Arkansas. Obviously, each store and club has personnel that's designated to a security function. But we needed to create an environment um, that can be drawn back, you know, to the to headquarters, so that we're receive that information. So Lucas is going to go over, you know, our emergency operations center and the 24/7 component of it. But the kind of the backbone of our operations, we have incident and event management, and we have an um, in-house solution that was built for it. And it's the same solution we actually use for our business continuity plans um, that we use for incident intake. And in Lucas's shop is 24 seven. Um, and today's average is 400 incidents. And those are called in, called in from actual impact to a store or a club um, into our emergency operations center. And he'll go over a little bit of the history and what those numbers were before 2020 and what they are today. 
from an emergency notification standpoint, um, the technology that we use or the vendor is Everbridge um, as far as pushing out from a campus standpoint, so from a corporate. But then we also have another in-house solution, an app that was built on the backbone of our Walmart and Sam's Club apps to push out um, notifications at Sam's and at clubs. You'll see that that's the, um, the snapshot that we have on the screen. So our store manager can quickly um, both notify us and then notify um, associates in that store of the situation. And this was an idea that Lucas had been working on for a number of years. And it was actually something that COVID was very helpful. When you're in the middle of a crisis and you say, we just need some dollars to get this off the ground um, because the EOC was actually taking all the COVID calls. And that was a management issue. There's no way we, we the, the team was not built to take that volume of calls that were coming in on a daily basis. So we're able to kind of get this pushed out and used heavily to take a lot of the COVID calls that were coming in. And then the GIS mapping, um, a lot of you I know use Esri as kind of the backbone for your mapping programs, um, we do as well. And here's one of the coolest maps. And again, this was um, thanks to COVID um, that we were able to kind of push funding to get this through. And remember, I told you about all the trucks that we have on the road. Now the EOC has um, a live feed of all the trucks and where they're headed. And it's updated every 30 seconds. And you can hover, this isn't a live map because I've learned the hard way, you never do present any technology live. But if you could hover your mouse over one of the trucks, you know where they are. Um, and why is this important? Why is this a big deal? And we saw this um, during the George Floyd protests Many of our trucks were headed into areas that were having um, protest issues, and we had a couple truck drivers shelter in place. And now we have visibility in where we're going, so we can pr provide them with vital information if we know a situation is happening. And on the disaster recovery and mitigation front, this is something that was really new to me. Um, this is kind of the insurance side of the house for emergency management. We have a team dedicated when I say team, that implies there's a lot of people. It's a team of two. I call them our cowboys. Um, and pre-COVID, they're usually on a plane dealing with an arson um, or flooding that might have impacted. Last year, predominantly, they had to mitigate all of this um, remotely. And it wasn't, I would say, kind of later in the year, we were able to kind of work out in a safe fashion to be able to deploy the team to help support this re um, recovery effort working with the vendors um, to, to make sure everything is done in one, a safe manner, um, and also in a fast manner, and that we can recoup as many um, of the, from the loss side, um, you know, and to hopefully um, from loss prevention and then the insurance side, recoup all of our losses um, to the best of our ability. And some of the numbers from last year, which I still think is kind of a amazing to me um, when you're dealing with the backdrop of COVID on top of all these um, hurricanes, another unprecedented unprecedented thing of 2020, but that we still had these numbers to be able to recoup these losses. But during um, the recovery for Hurricane Laura, we were able to deploy the two team members down there to help bring up our store in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It was one of the few places that was actually back up and running in, in three days. It was less than three days. We were able to get that store up and it was um, able to make it a location for FEMA to send their individual assistant teams to support the recovery of that area. And so it was really nice to kind of see the pictures out of there. Like Faith said, this is kind of the part of our job that's awesome because it warms your heart that we're supporting the response um, at large as opposed to just the response or impact to the company. Now I'm going to turn it over to Lucas's shop, who obviously had a lot of um, work and every crazy thing except the alien attack thrown at them last year. Lucas, to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Lucas McDonald, uh, Director of Operations, as Andrew mentioned. Uh, I've been with the company uh, just about 13 years now, um, and it's amazing. Um, 13 years, but I'll tell you the last year um, probably has felt like the, the most I've learned um, a lot because of the situation uh, that we were put in also because of Andrea's leadership. Um, well, look, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's amazing um, how much we had thrown at us. It's also amazing how much help we had. Um, we've got an incredible company and everybody just jumps in to support. Uh, if you look at, at the picture there on your screen, that is our physical watch center, uh, kind of our, we'll call our, our watch box. Um, that's where, it's our 911 dispatch, uh, taking calls 
Um, you know, Andrew mentioned some of the numbers a few minutes ago. Uh, it's an incredible increase, but they're taking calls from uh, most of the time store management or club management. Uh, I have a problem of some sort that I need the company's help with. That problem could be a power outage, which means all of my ice cream is melting. Uh, it, it could be a deli fire, or it could be there's a raccoon in the garden center. Uh, there are a lot of different things that could come up, as you can imagine, at a store um, that they might need help with. And, and when they think about Walmart, when our store management thinks about Walmart, they think of this giant corporate entity that just can help them with anything that they need help with. And so they call us, and sometimes it's two in the morning, uh, and we do our best to help them uh, the best we can. We, we took this virtual, um, and, and while we had always had a plan in place to do this virtually due, due to a snowstorm or some other type of, of event, those have always been one-offs, um, but we took it totally virtual, uh, like everybody else in March, and I'll tell you, our crisis managers did a phenomenal job. They didn't miss a beat. They took care of those store managers who, you know, the store managers and the, and the associates in the stores, obviously, were all in person still. Um, they didn't miss, miss a beat. They took care of those stores and continue to do so. Um, and they're doing a, a phenomenal job at that. And I think we've learned so many different things and, and there will probably moving forward be some sort of hybrid approach uh, to make sure that we can ensure that we've got that continuity, whether it's in person or virtually. So we, we've got our, there's kind of two sides of, of the, the business that I have. One is the 24 seven watch and then the other piece is the traditional emergency operations center or the activations as you would think of. And so um, one of the things that, that we have is an emergency support fun uh, function structure, just like any other EOC. We, we worked hard to make it seamless. Uh, we put everybody in like buckets. We have 10 of them and we Walmartized them kind of based on our priorities. Uh, and so when you hear about Walmart and what we do, we always talk about our people coming first. Uh, so ESF1 people, every EOC call uh, that we have, uh, we lead with our people. What is it that has impacted our people and how can we help them? Uh, and once we know that our people are, are good, uh, then it's kind of running down the list of our operations. So ESF2 operators, uh, what do you need? What do you need from a facility standpoint? What do you need from a merchandise standpoint? Um, and then at the bottom is, is our community piece. Um, and it's not that our communities come last. It's just we need that size and scope uh, of our operations to be in place before we can support that community. Um, we have a lot of resources. And then once they're up and running, then we're able to support them. So you'll always hear us. Associates, operations, and communities, and in that order. And it's just a, amazing what we can do and the expertise that we might have. Um, and I say we, not me, but from our operators that have been through things before. Uh, a quick example is after a, a tornado had hit a town in Oklahoma, uh, the, one of the leaders said, we need more uh, auto care center associates uh, in that town. And I'm thinking, why is auto care a priority right now? But what she had remembered was that the first responders kept running over over nails and other debris getting flat tires so our best way to help the community at that time was to fix flats for first responders uh, and so those are the kind of things that somebody that's just um, been put in a devastating situation they're not going to be thinking of but the expertise that our team has um, they remember those things and have those things as the to-do list and so we can kind of knock those out um, and they do a fantastic job of it we, we've always been somewhat virtual in the fact that our decision makers um, aren't always in the room. So we have a, an emergency operations center, right? We have uh, the, the location there in Pittenville. Well, an EOC call will have, you know, 100 people in the room, but then we may have, may have another 300 people uh, on that call. And then on that call would be, say, a senior vice president. And that person is the one that's making decisions. Hey, we're going to uh, close this door. We're going to open the store. We're going to move bottled water here or there or whatever. Uh, and so we've always had kind of that virtual aspect to us, um, but obviously uh, in March that, that changed when we went 100% uh, uh, of virtual um, and the, the home office emptied out and, and we started doing this um, all the time. And, you know, I, I was confident that the EOC call part would be just fine. Uh, there's a picture you can tell um, Brandon's there giving us, I'm sure, some, some wise uh, advice there uh, on what we should be doing. Um, you can see them highlighted there, but you know, I was confident that we could do the call part of it. It was, how does the rest of that EOC work where you have this busy room where there's snacks and coffee on the outside and everybody's just moving and there's papers flying and people having conversations and walking over to each other. What was that going to look like? Um, and so we tried this idea of, of just leaving a zoom up 24 seven and it was going to be like the physical EOC, where you could step in, ask a question, and, and step back out if you needed to. Uh, 
Um, and that has been a tremendous success. We've had that up and running back since, since um, we left the home office. So for over a year now, this has been going. Um, and many of us gather in every morning and, and just have a conversation. Hey, did you know about this? And oh, by the way, I can't believe my dog did that yesterday. And did you see that basketball game? Or did you hear about this initiative the company is doing? It's just the, the, the conversations are all over the place. And some of it is just kind of, you know, some of it's just kind of water to cooler talk. And the other part of it is, hey, the conversations that you would have in a hallway, we're now having in the virtual emergency operations center. And I, I think that has been um, incredibly helpful and a big key to our success being virtual because we're all, we are still able to learn about what the company's doing in different ways. Um, and so, Andrea, I think, you know, we're going to talk about what a, what a year it was and um, how the world changed uh, very quickly. And, and I'll send it over to you and we'll come back and kind of talk through those, uh, those responses. Well, yeah, I think you said it best, Lucas, because it was such a fast um, pivot, right, for us in March to, to go from the safe place. Everybody, and that's one of the things that I, first thing I noticed when I joined Walmart was how everybody, if they heard something bad was going on, they just come to the EOC. It was their safe place. And they could find out, um, one, information about what was happening, but then to participate, participate in the response and everybody work together. And it was such a, um, a, a huge testament to Lucas, how he was able to kind of shift us to saying, hey, we're taking this, this feeling, this environment, all virtual. And that having it just, I can drop in and see how, oh, is, is the baby gonna be in here today? Or is, or is somebody's dog there, right? It created that environment um, for everybody. And now it feels, um, like almost weird, like it's almost going to be weird when we like make the shift back because it's, we've all grown to everybody's family and we'll need like a Zoom reunion of kids and pets and stuff that have been part of every response. And so, you know, it's fascinating because COVID almost became the backdrop of every other response that we had last year. And the reason why I pulled this picture up, so this is in mid-March of 2020, that's our CEO. Um, at the, the, on the day that the president declares the national emergency. And um, this, Lucas got the shot. This is in the EOC and everybody was there, um, kind of that full room environment um, that you saw. And it was just one amazing, amazing to be there because after Doug spoke, everybody was clapping their hands and cheering. And that's the moment I knew my life had changed completely because it was such this, drop into an, a foreign environment. I felt very much like Alice in Wonderland because I didn't know what to do or how to handle this, this crisis. And then here's our CEO, you know, saying we, we stand at the ready to support the nation. And so it became very clear to us um, how, what we needed to do. And everyone, Brandon, Faith, Lucas, had their marching orders of how we're gonna support this. And it was literally the next day um, if Lucas takes the EOZ kind of virtual, I stay physically in there and we do the call. And this was our slow walk to push everybody into the Zoom box environment. And so that, that picture to me is like forever ingrained because it was, that was the kickoff to the year of just what seemed like endless response. And so Lucas, I mean, this kind of gives you that snapshot of, of what it was for us. Yeah, you know, a normal year we would do 20, 25 EOC activation uh, coordination calls. Uh, you can see the 150 there. Um, and most of those were, were on the, I would say, you know, the, the March through October timeframe as we went from daily COVID calls for a period of time. And then we, we kind of, as we were winding those daily calls down, we went right into the civil unrest calls. Um, and then we went right into to hurricane season. And so just uh, an unbelievably busy time. I think there, you know, not that there are ever advantages of, of COVID, but the advantage of us being remote is probably the, the virtual side of it allowed us to, to be able to balance life and work at the same time because we were all dealing with kids being out of school now and you know, there's no places in the kids, um, so many different things happening. Um, and so being able to, to kind of balance all of this um, virtually um, was, was helpful. Um, I hate to say it that way, but it was helpful to be able to do such a busy hurricane season and other, other parts of um, the activation. There, were, there was a lot more to 2020 than just um, the COVID response, as everybody knows. 
Um, the civil unrest piece, uh, you know, when I look back at, at 2020, I, I, I forget that this is really happening just about six weeks after we left the home office or five weeks even after we left the home office. So it isn't like that this virtual response was was a, a new way of working. It was still something we were very, very quickly trying to to figure out how to to handle and um, put this picture up here. This I think this picture means a lot. And what you see there is a store on the left side in, in North Carolina um, that there were some um, marches and, and protests that were going to be very near that store. In fact, really right out front of the store. Um, and the the business leaders made the decision that it would be best to close that store um, for safety reasons. Um, and so they've made that decision. But what they didn't do is they didn't walk away. You can see on the right side, uh, there's a tent there and there's an associate handing out water to people that were that were there in town. Um, and so we were still able to serve that community and to be a good partner and at the same time make a, a business decision on safety reasons that we felt we had to make. Um, so I just I love the fact that, that store is there, just really part of that community uh, at such a, a tenuous time. You look at, at the 1800 calls, we, we took a day for three days. That was just, uh, uh, we, we had so many stores that were closing or reporting um, different things that it was an incredibly busy time for us. And, and that broke our record of the most calls in, in, a, in a day by a long shot. We had 135 stores that were closed um, across the country. Now we've closed a lot of stores before at one time, but that's usually, you know, we're going to close 200 stores in Florida or, you know, 300 stores in Texas due to a natural disaster, but have 135 stores closed, um, you know, spaced out across the country was, was a pretty big uh, event. So we had, we, we had, we had COVID was kind of the first big activation. And then we had civil unrest was, was the next big activation. And we have a mix of hurricanes and derechos, right? Uh, and Andrea mentioned derecho earlier. Uh, you know, it's a, a thunderstorm that just goes on forever and just wipes out power to a whole lot of stores. And oh, by the way, wants to wants to look at the Chicago market where we have a lot of stores. And um, the one thing about uh, about something like this is um, my background is in meteorology, so I can I can confidently say we have no idea how to predict these well. Um, we know that there are going to be a lot of thunderstorms. We can we think there will be a lot of wind, but you don't know when and where you're going to have an 80 or 90 mile an hour wind that lasts for. 100 miles and uh, having 40 some stores down on power due to one thunderstorm, for lack of a better term, is a, is a big event. Um, and it's not one that you can prepare well for. Um, and so in the middle of, of responding to everything else, we have this ratio in August of 2020 that um, is, a, is a very significant event. Um, and we have a hurricane season like no other. Um, you know, we had 2017 and we had 2018, which were both very busy hurricane seasons. Um, and then we get to, to 2020 and we, we may not have had one um, like Harvey where you have a, a Houston that is completely underwater, but you still have very serious uh, hurricanes and, and Sally and Laura, you know, both very um, serious hurricanes and all hitting, it seems like Louisiana time after time. And then we have the one that nobody can say, Isaias, and I hope I got that close, um, that runs up the East Coast um, and takes out power uh, as a tropical storm. Uh, to, to a lot of the folks in the, in the Northeast. Um, we, unfortunately, the civil unrest um, had given us practice at being remote and the teams just did an amazing job responding uh, to these hurricanes remote. And, and just, it just it was a, kind of a new way of working every day. Uh, we knew that we would be in there, um, you know, responding and, and kind of coordinating efforts uh, for these towns that were impacted by, by hurricanes. And, I will, I will, since we're kind of focused on the idea of a virtual EOC, I will tell you that one of the things we, we learned is, um, unfortunately, we had a, um, a pretty significant shooting at one of our locations on the West Coast, um, and it was a, a Saturday afternoon, and what we learned is that virtually we can respond uh, as, a, as a corporate EOC much quicker, right? So we, we have an incident, we need everybody to come in and, and start working on the response. Um, in this case, we don't have to stop what we're doing, you know, change clothes maybe, and then drive to the physical emergency operations center. We walk to our computer, turn it on, and now we're just in full response mode. Um, and so we'll figure out how to how to have kind of a hybrid approach um, going forward. Um, but we did learn that we're a little faster there. Uh, so Andrea, the good news is that 2020 ended and all the activations ended. Oh, right, this. So. <laughs> So 
the winter storms, the winter storm we had in, in 2021, um, the, the cold we had um, well down into Texas, um, was something we saw coming. We, we saw that there would be a lot of cold. We saw that there'd be a lot of snow and we started preparing many days ahead of that. What we did not anticipate well would be, was the, the rolling blackouts that were to occur. Um, and so we at one point had, um, the, the, the yellow number you see there at 337, that screenshot was take, wasn't taken the peak. You can see on the bottom, 651 stores and clubs closed at peak. That's the largest number of closures we've ever had due to a, a natural disaster. Um, and by the way, the 1800 number went up to 2000. Um, so I think that the point here is that uh, the records continue to, to break um, and our emergency support functions and our emergency management team um, continue to perform very well in what is a, a tough environment. So hopefully now we are done with the big activations, Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> I still like when any time I look at that hurricane map, it's like I get a little shell shocked because it just felt one after another coming through. And and I'm sure those of you listening probably had that same feeling. And I truly did think, you know, naively so, like 2021, like, oh, we're gonna ease back into things. And I'm just speaking personally for just a moment, Bentonville, Arkansas got to negative 20. That is how you kill somebody from Southern California, just <laughs> FYI. I did not go out of my house for two weeks so I once again was very thankful for the virtual environment so I would be employed. So thank you, Lucas. One note before we kind of take down the screen and answer questions. Um, one of my favorite parts of this job is the, the community support that Lucas mentioned. And then out of every response, um, the Walmart Foundation in, in just Walmart as a whole, you know, really was supporting the nation and giving back to communities. And there's so many like news articles that came out, especially during the heat of COVID. And right now, actually with the vaccine clinics, and if you go to our corporate website, you can see, you know, any of our, our pharmacies that are offering the vaccine and you can sign up for it. And then there was a great article that was done um, about the winter storms response and, and Lucas has highlighted in it by Forbes. And it's just, it's so cool to kind of like feel that you're playing part of history and really helping people. And so I have to say that even though it was a really, really tough year, um, once we got into the groove, I'm one so fortunate to have the best team on the planet to work for because I knew nothing coming into this um, from a retail standpoint, didn't speak the language. And to now like see this and to play a um, small part of it was pretty awesome. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm actually going to turn it over to you, Justin, for some questions. Perfect. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. It really gave us a great perspective of not just how you responded to COVID and the many other disasters that were occurring across the globe, but really how you maintained all the other functions within your emergency management, business continuity, security environment. Um, and I, I think that was really uh, a great perspective that we can continue to do things like preparedness and really promote all those other activities, even in this new virtual environment. So I have a couple of questions um, that uh, we put together to kind of get uh, some understanding of how you uh, rolled out the various systems that you used during uh, this past year, uh, but also about you know what you think the future of, of virtual EOCs and, and, and planning looks like. The first one, um, is really for, for both Lucas and Faith. I'll have Lucas answer first, but um, from, from your perspective, you mentioned a number of different tools that you use to manage your virtual operations. Um, maybe tell me what were some of the key ones, the most important ones that you had to have available to you in order to, to make this work? Yeah, so we have a kind of a hybrid approach. We have a, an incident management tool um, that uh, we use to kind of keep track of our store closures when it's open and closed. And that's primarily used by um, on the emergency management, emergency operations side, primarily used by my team and that intake uh, call center type I was mentioning. Um, but then we were able, we've got a GIS platform, Esri, like everybody else uh, uses. Um, we're able to take that open and close uh, status. And that's really what's one of the most important pieces of information for us. We're able to share that uh, through there, uh, you know, on maps and in story maps and everything else. Uh, one of my favorites, um, and the team who watched the team Wi Fi mentioned this, um, I'm a big fan of Workplace by Facebook. 
um, mm -hmm. because so many people use Facebook every day to get information. And so Workplace just does that um, in the same manner. It, it's something that people are very comfortable using. And so it's kind of that snippet or a news story or shared link and then comments. And I can see who's seen it, um, whose response and who's responding to it. So uh, we have several different tools in different ways. And, and we're always trying to, to think about what the next best one is as well. Absolutely. Faith, how about you? I mean, you, you were working with many external stakeholders through this response. What were some of the tools you, you were using? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's actually kind of the same list, just looking at it from a different lens. So when you have that open and closed operational status dashboard coming out of the, the ERC, it's then taking that and then flipping it to those partners. Um, so that way you have it in your suite of information um, versus you know, every day sending an email or a phone call of, hey, where are you at today? Um, we're just putting that information at your hands. And so it's creating that information flow. I will also say um, Zoom and the, the platform of having our virtual EOC. When we deployed um, our associates to Louisiana and Texas, they're sitting in a physical EOC in the state. And then on their laptop, they've got our virtual EOC up. And so whether it was an issue from a Walmart perspective or an issue from a state perspective that we're trying to, to coordinate back and forth between, they could you know, pull up the Zoom and just immediately have this conversation um, with our emergency support function to say, hey, where's, where's this truck that we know is coming um, and find an ETA and then get it back to the state and then vice versa, um, you know, asking about a transportation route or something to that effect. So it's really using the same information um, and the same system. It's, it's just kind of flipping it a little bit on how we use it and who's getting access to it. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the next question, I think this is probably for Brandon. Um, one of the components of this session that we've been asking some of the emergency management agencies about is the use of these tools for planning as well. Um, most of the time we're in a conference room and we're developing those binders and different plans that we uh, are so, uh, so accustomed to in the emergency management and business continuity world. Um, from your perspective, do you see a use for these virtualized collaboration tools and things like Zoom in order to put together the future of your business continuity plans for Walmart? Um, absolutely. I, you know, I'd say you know the good, good and the bad of Zoom. Right? We've we've got almost instant access to meetings and people, and um, kind of creates this day long endless Zoom, but. Um, for us, I think, you know, it's really given us the opportunity to, to connect with more people quickly and to be able to have more access than maybe we would have had just because, you know, in a typical office setting, we're, you know, going back to meetings, walking, driving to other buildings and so on. So I, I think for one thing, we got more access and I'm not sure how we, we maintain that or if we want to kind of moving back into more of an office setting. Um, more from the planning side, you know, we, we had an opportunity, we were in, you know, BC 2.0, right? This was our first year and a half, two years into our new BC planning technology. And so it really gave us an opportunity um, to kind of dig into some of those plans. We were migrating into our tools and to pull out some key aspects that were very useful to, you know, how many associates do we need? If we need to create office space, you know, even, you know, Lucas mentioned about winter storms and here we were in a virtual environment and what happens in our virtual environment if we lose our, our new facility, right, our new home and we need to fill over to a, a corporate office that now has a more stable either internet connection or heat or whatever the case might be. So um, really need opportunity to use those BC planning tools and to pull the data from those tools and help our businesses drive decisions that they were making. Absolutely. And Lucas, I, from the emergency operations side, do you see any kind of connection between planning and, and being able to roll those, those things out for, for your emergency operations functions? Well, I think we had, a, we had a, a tremendous need to gather data from the field. Um, we you know, think about from a, a, the COVID standpoint, um, the concerns that a store might have and they may have had a customer come in that was coughing or an associate that wasn't feeling well. And early on, those were really important questions we were answering. And, and it kind of became a, a, a more normal uh, way of working, but we needed to, to work to figure out how we could 
kind of take that data and get that into the hands of decision makers. Um, and so our team's uh, technical side did a fantastic job of putting together uh, an emergency response app um, that we were able to, to use to gather a tremendous amount of data um, that became um, just the way we took in data and really saved my team from a, a call standpoint because there's no way we could have handled the number of calls that were coming in on top of the civil unrest calls we were taking and the hurricane calls we were taking and the ratio calls and everything else. And so uh, we were able to really work with our tech partners um, to put in put together a plan that worked really well for us. And I think yeah. just if I could jump in just to sure. make the plans actionable, I think that's what we really learned about last year. And, and to show that connection between the um, it's really the process, right? It's a planning process that leads us into the, a seamless response effort. And that's um, making sure that everybody not only like spent the time to, hey, remember we had a plan, but just it's the back of their hand, like Lucas is saying, it's just like it needed to be like, this is how we respond on a daily basis and make it more standard operating protocol. And so it was, I think it's almost a subtle nuance to how we just embedded the planning process into everything that we did. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Andrea, I, you kind of got to oversee this whole thing and, and, and see really from start to finish how it all came together. From, from your perspective, were there any key lessons learned or things that you would recommend for uh, government agencies or even other corporations that are rolling out a, a virtual EOC set of tools like this? Just a, a reminder for everyone that the technology um, behind it is people. And so there was such a big focus. Obviously, we had to have technology to help us do our business, but we forgot a little bit about our people. Like our people are not machines that can be on Zoom calls 15 hours a day without having ramifications. And also on top of that, those who have families and who had to set up their kids and have the technology at home. And it's not all created equal. You know, some um, folks had great internet access. Some didn't have internet access. And then I swear like by my fifth Zoom of the day, like I'm gonna lose my mind. And so just don't forget about your team and, and it's you as, as their manager or their leader to do temperature checks and ask, what do you need to do your job better? And I. Um, I saw Walmart kind of quickly kind of be able to shift to that, but there was such a mad push. We got to keep working. We got to keep things going, which obviously is important, but then you have to take that step back and remember your people and, and try to engage them in different ways because it was such a family environment at Walmart. That's one of the reasons why I came here. And when you lose that connection and people are, were having a tough time and, and to, one, it's important to recognize that and then just find ways by asking folks what they need. Um, I just, I, to me, that was a big lesson learned, uh, you know, because I, I just, I, I even found myself like going, I can't keep at this pace, right? Mm -hmm. And that I physically had to and have like artificial boundaries of like, I am going to get up. And when I go through that door, my reality changes, <laughs> right? And just do that. And, and it had to come from me to force it to the team. Absolutely. Now, um, you, you provide in the presentation a really great overview of the different functions that you're using these tools for everything from resource management, to emergency alerting, uh, situation reporting. You know, you, you really had something for every one of those different normal emergency management activities. Um, were there any things that you were able to do using these new virtual EOC tools that you may not have been able to do in that physical environment in the EOC? That's a really good question. I mean, Lucas, I'm going to kick it to you because you would know best. My, my immediate response is that it provided access, right, to audiences that maybe not normally would have access to it. We could say, hey, here's the Zoom. Just drop into the EOC and, you know, and talk to look at Joe who's putting up a map, you know, on something like that. But Lucas, you would know better. So let me kick it to you. Yeah, I think, I think one, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, it, it made us faster, right? It, it, and a lot of people to jump in much um, more quickly than they could otherwise. But I think the other thing is, is as, like you're saying, Andrea, that maybe seven, eight days before, before a possible hurricane, we started holding kind of an 8 a.m. briefing. These are people that wouldn't have normally walked down into the EOC. Um, and before, all of this happened wouldn't have felt comfortable jumping onto a zoom but now you know what this is a new way of 
of working, I'm going to jump in there. It's okay that, you know, I, I just woke up and, and still in a sweatshirt or whatever. This is, and have my coffee. This is just how we all start our day. And so I think we were able to kind of um, gather people and, and give them plan, early planning um, information earlier than we would have otherwise. Absolutely. That makes sense. Um, one of the things that you'll see in this uh, session is most of the vignettes that we've done with emergency managers from, uh, from state and local agencies has been uh, that they had to do a significant shift um, because this was not a capability that they really had normally. Uh, but you're an international corporation, as we've seen. And, um, you know, I, I can see a lot of benefits in being able to integrate people from around the globe in your sort of virtual emergency operations center that you wouldn't be able to do in Bentonsville. Um, so, you know, Brandon, maybe you can talk, because you've talked about kind of the global perspective, trying to standardize globally, but being locally relevant. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the benefits of being able to engage all those different sectors from around the globe and in, into your emergency response planning. Yeah, I guess I, I, what I'd start off was, you know, we, we saw with COVID, um, you know, impacting our international or Asian markets first. And so, Certainly, having the the opportunity and to you know to witness and to understand what they were going through, to anticipate you know we've all lived through H one N one and some of the other um, other outbreaks that we've had over the years, but um, being able to watch them close their offices, go to remote, see what you know the children now going to remote school was impacting local ISP providers and and how they were starting to deal with that, how they were beginning to think about working at different schedules, different times of the evening, you know, where the schools weren't competing with work for, for ISP. And so um, those were one of the, the first neat things that we got to see. And then secondly, um, for them to start integrating into the global EOC once we were fully activated, they were now, now had the access to all their peer organizations around the world and were, were able to start sharing those, those best practices right away. Um, from a peer-to-peer -peer coordinator or market-to-market -market relationship. Um, one thing I would say is that, that we kind of learned here domestically is that um, our partners, our, our, our coordinators, our, excuse me, our leadership teams, you know, planning isn't their day-to-day -day business. And so we kind of took an approach of more of a resilience business partner that we're really going to build out this year. And so, it, you know, we're going to know, do a little bit more hand-holding, more white glove service, to those crisis management teams to help them integrate into the response to um, more give them those subtle reminders and say, hey, you, know, you haven't activated yet, but you should be considering it. You should be talking about these things with your teams and you should be considering bringing your folks together and starting to kind of mobilize a response on that. So um, a little bit of a lesson learned and a little bit of what we you know, really kind of appreciated seeing out of the international markets. Absolutely. And, and the same thing for you, Lucas, you know, when I think of um, how you can manage even just something as simple as your briefings that you are going to conduct within the emergency operations center, was there, was there some benefits in being able to, to now uh, brief to all of the sectors and, and components across the globe and, and any, any big changes in how you did that virtually versus how you might have to try and do it with the people in the room? during a normal activation and then try and also do it for people who might not be in the room in the future. Yeah, I would say our, our biggest thing was, it wasn't our ability to brief out, but their ability to brief in. All of a sudden now we're hearing from markets in, in Asia, as Brandon said, who dealt with this earlier than in say South America. And so we're able to learn from each other, hey, mm -hmm. this, this country is at this point, And at this point, this is what we did and this really worked well, or this didn't work so well, so don't try that. Um, it was also the first time that we had actually brought all countries together for one global EOC call. In the past, we've had calls for things like the tsunami earthquake in Japan, um, but that's still kind of regionalized. Uh, this was the first time that we brought all the markets together in one EOC call. Um, and it really kind of gives you the chills when you're doing it. Great. We have everybody here and, and all of Walmart together. Um, and just so thankful that we're able to learn from each other. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really important thing, especially since... So many of us were seeing the same things, but we wanted to transfer that knowledge to others so that they'd be able to more effectively respond. Um, Faith, I, one of the things that I think is 
is something we're trying to learn about is, is how uh, organizations were able to pivot quickly uh, using these virtual EOC tools to deal with new and emerging uh, challenges during COVID. Uh, you were working with a lot of different organizations and agencies. Were there any big integrations or, or, or changes you had to make on the fly during this response? Yeah, so I would say a couple things. Um, there's obviously, if you think back to the very beginning of it, right, even from an EM profession, you know, FEMA wasn't the lead um, agency uh, when this kicked off. And so just trying to take what we know, but also toe the line of kind of where things are at and then flip when, you know, they took, took over from a lead agency standpoint from the federal government. Um, that happened to be when I, the week I was in DC um, for that. And so it's, how do we navigate with what we know? Um, I think the biggest thing there is the technology. Um, so going back to, to GIS um, maps and linking into different, you know, groups and web EOCs and, you know, what's your platform? How do we become a part of your, you know, EOC response, whether it's from a COVID standpoint and wanting to understand what's happening in your state or it's a hurricane and, you know, can we connect with the state of Florida virtually? Um, and to some degree, yes, but then to some degree, like we need to be on site. And I think what was great and a good pivot point there was it also gave us that prioritization of, you know, we know Louisiana is get, about to be hit um, significantly, but that doesn't mean the other states aren't involved. And so from, from our perspective with our public private partnership team, it gave us the ability to say, this associate's going and you're gonna focus on Louisiana. And then we're gonna take, you know, the other six states that are involved and split them up and we'll be virtually connected. So it's kind of this physical virtual coordination and, and how do we use technology to coordinate that. The other piece I would say um, to, to pivot quickly and often in the last year was um, government orders. And so um, when you think about an executive order and a declaration, right? We see them all the time. Typically it's a pretty boilerplate. This is getting us to the next level of a response from a, a resource standpoint. We quickly pivoted to every city, county, <laughs> jurisdiction was creating their own order with some sort of business implication that then we've now got to take in, process, understand what it means to the business and then coordinate across all components of our business, you know, not just stores, but VCs and um, our e-commerce business. And then those changed. So, right, those started as stay-at-home orders, then they were capacity orders, then they were masks, then they're reopening, now they're vaccination. So they're, they're one, haven't stopped, two, they've changed consistently. Um, but, you know, how do you build a process that takes that in, processes it, gets it through for all of the jurisdictions in the entire U.S.? Um, and so that was something that we had to pivot quickly on um, multiple times and then actually, you know, ultimately pivot again to it's not a crisis anymore from a standpoint. It's now day to day business. And so how does this incorporate into our day to day business? And, and thankfully, we have some good partners in our compliance business. So that's what they do. And we were able to transition that to them. Um, and they're still working on it. It's still being collected, still being you know sent out to the teams. And so, you know, building that in a way but constantly being able to stop and renegotiate kind of where you're at on it um, was definitely a learning for sure. Absolutely. Andrea, um, you have a pretty professional team here and, and this is just a subset of them. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as a manager, sometimes you, it's, it's important to have them easily available to you and uh, be able to work in the same environment. You know, when you shifted to virtual, were there any challenges and being able to, to manage this team uh, virtually and, and what were some of the strategies you used to uh, to kind of keep this going for as long as you have? I feel super lucky like like I had mentioned before that one I have the best team on the planet. Two, um, when I could put my big girl pants on and not feel sorry for myself about not knowing anybody and, and knowing my environment. Um, I, you know, I had for years actually managed remote teams. So it wasn't really a foreign concept to me, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, like the home base team was different. So I feel like I might've been more comfortable that, with this as opposed to maybe some other managers who had never had to manage remotely because I kind of, the culture 
um, at Walmart was very much, um, you know, everybody comes into the office pretty early hours and um, works long hours and I see you, therefore you're working kind of approach. And so this was for the company at large, I think a very um, challenging transition for them. And so I just, you know, when it's all, it's emergency management is the conductor of um, what's going on. It's easy to see um, the output of the team and that um, things, things were getting done. Because, you know, if you keep it focused on meeting deadlines and um, if, if there's any issues that way, then you don't need to see somebody every second of every day. And plus in emergency management, if I literally saw them every second of every day, they're probably not doing their job. <laughs> and I'm not doing a good job because I'm micromanaging them. And so I think, you know, and for the emergency management community, right? It's that everybody is so comfortable with coming physically to the EOC, right? Even for me, like when we were go, it was going down, like, you know, we're going into COVID. I'm like cleaning, I'm going around cleaning because it was therapy for me because it's just like, this is one thing I can control and we all know we're supposed to do this. But I just making sure that the team knew that I was accessible and that you could just pick up the phone or send me a text. But then also encouraging, I, and, I, and I just really want to highlight it as a big lesson learned for me is, is saying everybody on the team, no matter what their role was, you had to have some boundaries. So that you had to get up and get out and go for a walk or just go, get away from the space because it was just all consuming. It, especially as Lucas pointed out, like we kind of rolled from COVID into the civil unrest into the hurricane, right? It was, there was no stop. We get a breather. We were in constant state of um, activation. And it was just like Lucas and I deciding um, at the morning, like which incident we were gonna take to leave the call because we'd have one at this time and another at this time. And it's just like, what is it now? <laughs> Which one? And so just making sure to just, hey, take a step away. It, you know, the work's gonna keep coming. It, it, sadly, the crisis is still gonna be here. So more on that sense of just really like trying to taper folks back, you know, like you can't, you can't have the same visibility like you would have in the office. And that's not my expectation. And I had to be very clear about that. Yeah, and other managers were too, because it just, I don't think we've seen like the ramifications to mental health yet um, of what COVID has done. I would agree. I would agree. So to close this out, uh, this is sort of a lightning round. And the idea here is I, I want to know from your perspective, um, what do you see as the future of virtual EOCs? And, um, you know, I think the other piece of that is, is what's that one feature or, you know, you know, widget or whatever you think for that future of virtual EOCs that you want to see? What, what, what do you need for that next generation of virtual EOCs? So I'll, I'll start off with you, Lucas. What do you see as the future of virtual EOCs? I'm a big fan of um, Steven Spielberg movie, Ready Player One, because it just helps me visualize what, what virtual reality can look like. And before all this happened, I had told one of my, my senior managers, I want to be able to put on the goggles and I want to step into the EOC. I want to see what the crisis managers are seeing. Um, I don't want them to have to stop what they're doing. I just want to see what, what it is that they see. And, and so that's still my vision of the, of the future uh, EOC, both physical and, and virtual. I don't think there should be a difference whether I'm working here or working there. I see kind of the same thing. Um, you know, if I think about what would have been really helpful um, over the past year is the ability to take a system, whether it's our camera system or another system and have it, right now we're doing a lot of screen sharing, um, but how do I, as part of the Zoom, how do I just plug in and pull up that camera so we all see it at the same time without me having to stop what I'm doing and share a screen? And so that's, that's a short-term win, but the, the big win for me is Ready Player One. I want to look around and see the EOC. Cool. How about you, Faith? Yeah, um, from a lens of like a public-private partnership and integrating, you know, state and federal emergency management into private sector, I think it's that true combination, right? Like that there is a virtual EOC with a physical EOC because it builds that coordination and communication um, and then just constant data sharing, right? So it's not only in a bad day we're data sharing, but it's, hey, here's what's happening today and it's a seamless versus me having to go find it, you trying to send it to me. We're just, we're talking every day so we know what's going on. Um, and then we're constantly just 
adding to that coordination and communication back and forth. Cool. Brandon, what do you see as the future of, of virtual EOCs and planning? Well, from planning, I think, um, you know, certainly it's, you know, being able to plan and respond from any device anywhere. And so, you know, from our internal standpoint, just building on those tools that, that we've got to get us quick, quicker access to, to the data that we need and to get it back in our business leaders and so they can make some decisions on it. Um, it sounds like a, you know, like a, you know, a pitch for Zoom, you know, we talk about that a lot, but maybe more emojis for Zoom. I don't think the reactions that they're, that they're offering us really um, support our remote, um, remote feelings most of the time. All right, we'll ask them for those. We'll see if we can get those added in. How about you, Andrea, to close us out? Well, a couple of thoughts, you know, and I'm going to make all the folks focus on technology, their eyes roll, but it's always about process, right? The technology has to support your process. If you do not have a good process in place, your technology is irrelevant. So spend some time there and with all the lessons learned we just had, we have a million of them as an industry in emergency management. Um, and, you know, you always learn from kind of more the failure points than the successes. But I would say the success of this team was because of the process um, that was built before. And then we were able to quickly add technology to support it and do a plug and play model like Faith was suggesting is that we can um, have it externally, internally, and then give a true idea of impact. Lucas was able to tell that story in the EOC of what this meant, whatever the hazard was, to those most senior leaders. And that's that's super important from a private sector component. And just don't forget your people. I mean, we showed we can work from anywhere at any time. That doesn't mean that just because you can, you should. Um, but it also means that flexibility is super key. There's a lot of people who were impacted by COVID that might not have been able to work if there wasn't flexibility. And I know I have a, a couple moms on the team that they would not have been able to work if we didn't have this flexibility. So let's not lose that, you know, like keep that part because it, it made it amazing. I mean, we showed you what we were able to accomplish and we're just one entity at the end of the day. And if we can keep that, especially from a, a public sector standpoint, I mean, it's pretty amazing what we can do and accomplish. Absolutely. Well, uh, Lucas, Faith, Brandon, Andrea, thank you so much for uh, speaking with us today and, and kind of telling your story about uh, virtual emergency operations centers and the Walmart response and all of your operations. Uh, you've provided us a lot to think about when it comes to uh, the scale of how, uh, how large a, a virtual emergency operations center can get. We're not just talking about a small city or a state, we're talking about a global operation here. So uh, thanks for your, your insight. And uh, hopefully the attendees at uh, Inspire will be able to check out some of the other vignettes uh, and figure out how to implement a virtual EOC in their own organization. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Justin. Bye, everyone.